All right, everyone. Uh, for those of you who are joining us at DCI, if you'd like to find a seat. And for those of you on the webinar, we're hoping that you can hear us nice and clearly now. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to DCI's quarterly series on trends and travel. I'm Carolee Barnes, Senior Vice President and Partner of our Tourism Practice at DCI. And for those of you who are here for the first time or dialing in for the first time, DCI was founded back in 1960. And since that time, we've actually worked with more than 400 countries, cities, regions, and states, states to drive tourism and economic development. Um, that's included some destinations that I see here in the room today, which is pretty exciting, and, and some that are dialing in on the phone. Um, today, our tourism practice actually has three different divisions. We focus on travel trade marketing, on public relations and general tourism marketing, and meetings and incentive sales. On your chair today, you'll actually see a compilation of travel trends that have been predicted by a number of different organizations for 2012. But we actually have three uh, thought leaders in tourism here today that are going to talk a little bit about what they believe uh, is in store for us in 2012. This discussion is going to be a panel discussion that lasts about 50 minutes. And we're going to leave the last 10 minutes for Q&A. And for those of you who are dialing in on the webinar, you can type those questions in, and we'll make sure they're submitted as part of, as part of the Q&A session this afternoon. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our three speakers today. First up, on my far right, we have James Schillinglaw. James is the Editorial Director and Editor-in-Chief for Travel Alliance, which produces magazines we've all heard of, Agent at Home and Vacation Agent. He also oversees Travel Pulse, which is a daily newsletter that each of us that works at DCI reads every day, and many of you probably do as well, which summarizes the news um, of today for the travel industry. Prior to joining Travel Alliance in 2004, James was the Editor-in-Chief for Travel Agent Magazine. He holds a bachelor's degree in political science from Columbia University and currently uh, resides in Westchester County, New York. So he's virtually my neighbor. <laughs> Um, second, we have Terry Dale. Terry was named president of the U.S. Tour Operators Association in January of this year, so it's almost his one-year anniversary, so congratulations for that. He was previously the president and CEO of CLIA and has held distinguished leadership uh, roles at a number of DMOs, including NYC & Co., the Greater Providence CBB, and the New England Society of CBBs. He's also served on the board of directors for HSMAI and Visit Florida, and has just lectured on a number of occasions at NYU's Tisch Center for Hospitality and Johnson & Wales. Our final speaker for today is Mauricio Leighton. Mauricio joined Virtuoso back in March of 1998 to create Virtuoso's first international division. In 2005, he was appointed as Vice President of Global, Global Member Sales and Service. And then in 2007, he became the Head of Sales and Marketing for Virtuoso Alliances and works with tourism boards from across the globe. Mauricio helps destinations with product development, create programs to increase their profile among luxury travel advisors, and educates affluent consumers on their destination options. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you. So our first question for the day is sort of a fun one, just to get to know you a little bit better. Terry, when you're asked by your friends, what's the most amazing place you've ever visited? What do you tell them? I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> uh, 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 that, first of all, all my friends are in here, and I, I uh, like so many places. My initial reaction was the last place I visited, because it's fresh on your mind. And uh, Marco Island? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Marco Island. <laughs> so that's, that's really a tough one. I don't know. I've always said I could live in Hong Kong, because I think there's so many similarities between New York City and Hong Kong, that that's kind of obvious, the vibrancy, uh, just the, the energy and the size and scale of it. But um, I just, I am one of those travelers, which I think probably everyone in this room is, that uh, you get the best out of every destination that you go and see. And so as a result, when you, you go with that kind of mindset, uh, you have a terrific experience wherever you go, so I don't know. The family farm in Iowa. So <laughs> that has to rank up there, too. Very good. So, Mauricio, well, we've got a fun question for you. Let's say uh, Mark Zuckerberg's on the line, and he's, at, he's telling you that you've just won your dream trip of a lifetime on Facebook. Where are you headed? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, 
I think I would pick a safari with my entire family, my entire extended family, all 50 of us. Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, well, it, it is Mark Zuckerberg. It. I think he yes. can afford it. <laughs> yes. We'll ask for that. Yes. 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 James, throughout the years, what's been the most memorable assignment back when you were in your daily writing days, the most memorable assignment you had? No, I'm still in the <laughs> area. But, um, it, it, yeah, it was a situation. It was a few years back, if you remember, the foot and mouth crisis in Britain which were, you know, everybody's worried that they lost a lot of travel. And they took us over, uh, uh, Visit Britain took us over, and they took us up to Scotland, and they gave us a private charter plane up there. And then at the end, the last day, they took us back to uh, Heathrow, and uh, they bussed us to Windsor, where we met uh, Prince Philip. And uh, we talked with him for a while, and he gave us a private tour, just us and Prince Philip, which is, they're kind of worried about what he was going to say because he was a little bit worried about And then they bust us to Checkers, which is the country residence of British Prime Ministers, and we met Tony Blair. And we met him, and we were acting, effectively acting as lobbyists for Visit Britain to get more money for tourism. And finally, they bust us to 10 Downing Street. And we had a reception with Lady Blair. So that was a pretty impressive wow. day. And we were wine and dine throughout the whole thing. And at the end of 10 Downing Street, I was with a, a friend of mine who's a top, <coughs> top tour operator and some other journalists. We walked out of 10 Downing Street and we said, okay, who's taking us somewhere next? And that was it. <laughs> Make your own way back to Paddington Station and back to Heathrow. So uh, we were pretty, it was a pretty impressive day. And to that day, that's probably the most uh, you know, firepower I've, I've been through in that kind of assignment. So. Sounds like a good day, good day in travel. Absolutely. Uh, on that note, the impact of the financial downturn was widespread, but according to recent research by Focusrite, the U.S. travel market will fully recover ground loss during the recession by the end of the year. Yet we're hearing from economic pundits that 2012 is going to see a second dip in the economy in North America. So, you know, what do you think? Is it time to appear, prepare for the apocalypse part two, or, you know, what are your constituents saying? And I guess we'll start first with you, Terry. Well, we just recently uh, released 48 hours ago a uh, member survey result. And, you know, our members are cautiously optimistic. You know, they, over 50% had higher passenger volume this year as compared to the year before. When we looked at or asked about 2012, three quarters, felt that they would also see uh, passenger volume grow again. And, and I think equally as important is that the ADR uh, had increased in 2011, and they anticipate ADR again increasing in 2012. So I think you know, there's a certain um, thread amongst uh, at least our members and tourism where we, we tend to be optimistic people. Even when things are tough, we're always going to look and anticipate that things are going to get better. Having said that, though, I think we're also realistic to know that, you know, the way the stock market goes, we see uh, booking uh, trends follow the stock market. When it's, it's bottoming out, phones are quiet. When things pick up, the phones pick up. So it's not going to be a, um, a smooth ride in 2012, but I think there's optimism there, and, and, and we're hopeful that we're going to continue to see uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. Mauricio, would you say the same for the luxury travel segment, yeah. or would you say it's different? No, no, absolutely. I, I concur with Terry completely. And we actually have the bookings to prove it. We have a very strong advanced bookings uh, for next year. Uh, you know, we, we are probably going to have a record year if things go uh, somewhat well. Um, what we are finding amongst our clientele is that people are getting used to these uncertainties that we're living in, and that travel has taken yet another uh, place of priority to cope with what everything else that is going on. So travel is one of those things that people are not touching and that they're still going. And of course, they want it to be more meaningful, more enriching, and they want more value for their money, but they're definitely, definitely spending. We're back to the big bookings, big ticket items, longer vacations, et cetera. James, you have your finger on the pulse of really America's mainstream travel agents. What are you hearing from them in terms of consumer preferences for 2012? Uh, for 2012, I think they're really looking, um, they're still looking for a decent price, and they're looking for a deal. But they're more to the point, and we keep hearing this sort of amorphous word value. And that's what's happening. They're going to continue to travel. I'm, I'm not one who may think we're, we're already, already back from the recession, but I think, uh, you 
know, people, and Terry said this, I, I believe, too, where the, the travelers are getting a little more robust, that they want to travel, they realize this is an opportunity, and they're not going to be denied that. But at the same time, the price has to be right, and they have to perceive some value in it. I think a lot of things that happen, somebody said, I think it was at Terry's conference earlier this week, that um, uh, the value, you know, if people went out and started raising prices, and it was too soon. And you know they should they should have waited a little bit more, and I think that's going to be the same in in 2012. Uh, I think it, you're going to see somewhat of it's not going to be a huge growth year, but it's not going to go down. So that's I think where we're at. You know what's going to be interesting about next year as well is the fact that it's an election year, and, and that's surprising, right? Everybody uh, it's an election year, <laughs> uh, and and we'll somehow we'll get through that. But historically, an election year will soften travel somewhat. Right. But when you look at the room and the destinations uh, represented here today, um, you know the people who are going to travel internationally and uh, spend and invest more, I don't think it will pull back as much during an election year. Um, I'm hopeful that they won't, yeah. but it will impact some but, you know, uh, travel. People are habits. looking now for different things than they used to in travel. People are now, and we've talked about the word, and I know we talk at Virtuoso a lot at the conferences about experiences, and people seek experiences. They don't want to give that up. And I don't, you know, they will spend the money if the experience and the value is right. I think. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think that value means in that case? Because you say they're willing to spend the money if they see that there's value. Um, from your perspective, James, what does value mean to the U.S. consumer these days? Uh, you know, I'll go back to saying that value is a combination of price, what you're going to get, and the bragging rights uh, once you get back. Um, you know, people want unique things that they can talk about and they want to experience the world. You know, it's no longer just going on a beach or going on a cruise ship, uh, which is all great, all great kind of travel. They want some kind of, you know, validation, of personal, experience, you know, something that nobody else has. So I think that's what value is really all about today. It's, it's not just a function of price. It's a combination, and it's sort of, it's, it's hard. It's an elusive thing for a lot of travel marketers to get because, you know, as you said, what is value? You know, I think it's something that you, you interview your customers and you find out exactly what, what their hot buttons are and what they, they really perceive and what they want to do, what they've done, what they'd like to do, what's on their bucket list. You know, that's been a term everybody uses these days. But that's kind of where I see where value is, if that helps. I'm just kind of hoping that uh, we're starting to move away from value uh, being all about price. That it's really uh, for the consumer to get access to something that he or she couldn't get on their own. Yeah. Therefore, it's the travel agents um, and then the tour operators and the, hopefully the cruise lines and everyone who can access and create this experience that they can't get on their own. And, and, and there's tremendous value in that to a consumer if we bring it to the table for them to purchase. And, and I, 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 yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry, because I just wanted to add that, of course, I agree with, with percent. I think value, the way we're measuring today, is how, how much of an enrichment, what kind of impact that particular trip had on a particular person's life, you know, in which way they were enriched, you know, in which way it changed them or it moved them, whether it's what by being getting a, a deeper insight of the culture that you were they were experiencing, something that yeah. they it changed in them that wasn't there before they took the trip, and I think that's the value that a lot of the uh, operators and a lot of the people that service providers are understanding, and we know for sure that that's what we're looking for. I mean, the whole idea of virtuoso, we of course specialize in in luxury, and we deal with amazing suppliers and amazing destinations that provide what is called the tangible luxury, but what we're seeing is that all of that is just simply it has become the means to something much greater, which is what we're all striving to. And that's the surprising element to the consumer also. You know, I, so you can tell your customer, this is what you need, you know, based on what I know of you, because it's, 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 it's based on the relationship that our advisors have with the client, and this is what you need, and I want to expose you based on your interest. These are the types of things, you know, that will make your trip exceptionally unique and different and enriching. Yeah, I, I have two things in my notes that I uh, sort of the exclusivity of the experience that you're going to get and sort of your emotional reaction to the trip. And those are kind of things that Maurizio is talking about, and, and those are the things I think people are really looking for, which I don't think they did 20, 30 years ago necessarily oh. I, at all. I think it's a very different kind of travel market, especially in the U.S. Maybe in Euro Europeans were a little more... 
adventurous. Um, and I think that's made U.S. travelers a lot hardier than they used to be 20 years ago. At least I hope they are. Mm -hmm. Terry, um, USDA survey announced that among their active membership that the vast majority anticipated a growth in sales for 2012. And more than 25% of those surveyed say that they're actually forecasting a boom year for 2012. What types of programs are your tour operator membership seeking from destination? Well, I, I think we're actually touching on it uh, right now, and that's um, authentic experiences where you uh, you actually get in and, and around a neighborhood in a community and interact with people who call this home. Uh, and whether it's you know local artisans or historians, so I really think whatever you can do uh, from the region of the world that you represent to really create an interactive experience that uh, is with the people who call it home. I, I just think that stands out. I know um, I went to Turkey uh, this past August, and I think the thing that stands out in my mind, and I don't know if you've been to Turkey, it's fabulous, but I got a chance to go into the kitchen uh, of a woman who is known within her community for just being this amazing uh, chef, and nothing fancy, but the fact that you know we got to go into her kitchen in her home, spend time with her family around their table and explain how a typical, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce it, but this dish traditionally is this way, but our family has evolved it in this direction. That's what I took away as being you know, one of those special memories because it was um, a person that I could put a, a name, a face, and attach that experience to. So I think the more things you can do like that, uh, the better. Yeah. Mauricio, um, Cox & King, the luxury tour operator, re released just recently sort of what they thought their trends for 2012 would be. And they talked about sort of these ends of the earth journeys and mind, body, and soul vacations and, and actually spending money in destinations where the money would do some good, be it Japan, which has dealt with the tsunami, or New Zealand, which has dealt with the earthquake. Do you think that replicates with what your travel agent, high-end travel agent members are saying about what consumers are oh, interested in? Yeah, absolutely. I mean. First of all, I want to clarify that the, the uh, mind, body, and soul kind of interest, you know, could range from going on an extremely spiritual trip to an extremely good wine and food, uh, you know, kind of itinerary, because that's what, it, it depends on what the person is looking for, for in, in terms of enrichment, right? So, but just to go back a little bit to what Terry was saying, I think that a good thing that we could share with all the destinations, and many of the destinations, at least the partners that the virtuoso preferred destinations that are here today are very in tune with this concept. And it's the idea is that you have clients that have particular interests, but they want to meet the players that are behind the scenes of those particular interests. It's not just about tasting the best possible wine. They want to see the vineyard, and they want to know about the history of the people and the community where that vineyard is. Uh, the same thing with, you know, we had, um, I'm going to mention an example, we had a, one of our operators, she was on a trip this year and went to Egypt with the, with a group of, very small group of uh, uh, people from the U.S. industry, and she came back and immediately put trips together, and she was able to make connections while in Egypt, and she put trips where if you wanted to go to Egypt, you know, first of all, there were double, triple upgrades in all the upscale properties there, but you would also go and meet and have lunch or dinner with one of the people that were involved in the revolution in Egypt. Now, it doesn't mean we're promoting revolutions around the world, but it's, it is simply responding to the level of depth that the travelers want to acquire. It's not about promoting one thing or the other, it's just being in touch with what the client wants. You know, seeing something is not the same as feeling it. And I think people consciously or unconsciously are looking for uh, this change me, this move me, or the, you know, everything else that we talked about before, the bragging element, it, it becomes, you know, it's, it does, it, it changed me. It was life transforming, that, that sort of thing. So I think that absolutely that's, that's the trend. We also see from our hotel partners, we have a very, very rich value add program with our hotel partners, with our cruise lines that are part of Virtuoso. We have over 900 hotels in the Virtuoso Hotels and Resorts program. One of the key value-add 
components that has become extremely popular. Many hotels are adding to their list of value add to their clients. Do you want the upgrade? Do you want the massage? Do you want the, the meal? Or do you want the contribution to XYZ charities? And those charities are becoming extremely, extremely popular. So, you know, travel is taking back sort of, I think people are the more sophisticated, the more in tune, there is a, a sense of, not even guilt, there's a sense of responsibility now that is becoming more common than not. One of the trends we have heard from some of our destination partners is that more tour operators are actually building multi-city or multi-country programs. Um, and we suspect this may be a direct result of the fact that Americans are not using the vacation time that they get every year. Is that something that you see within all market segments from what you know of, James? Are you seeing um, agents selling multi-destination experiences to consumers? I'm actually seeing less multi-destination than immersion in one destination. Um, I think, and, and Terry will validate this too with the tour operators, there's a misnomer about what a tour is. The tour used to be multi-city, multi-destination throughout Europe, and that has completely changed in the last few years. Uh, you know, we used to think of, uh, for some of you are too young, but if it's Tuesday, it must be Belgium, uh, was the kind of the movie we still can't get out of our heads, even though I don't remember it myself, but I remember who was in it. But, uh, but it, it, it's become much more tours today uh, are really focused on one area of, of the country, they're, you stay in one place or maybe two places, and you go in and you experience some of the things uh, Terry and Maurizio are talking about. The you know you really get experiences. So I don't think you're getting multi destinations. You're going in and exploring a destination in depth. Regional destinations to some extent, yes. But um, you know every destination that you you folks represent, you know the goal has always been get that customer to experience that destination in its entirety, and not just be you know we're coming in for a day and then we're going off to the next one. Uh, I think people don't want that type of trip anymore, and, and I don't see our agents booking that. Uh, it is it has come a long way. I mean, people really didn't want to go. They saw tours. They think escorted on a bus, and it's not that way anymore. Uh, it's not that way. And even on the cruise side, you're getting a lot more overnights. That they're coming. They're going to come into port and stay, and stay maybe one night, two nights, three nights, and and they want to get that experience. Not not just you know, we're here in one port and then we're going up to the next. So that's what I'm seeing. I don't, I don't see the multi -definition. Elaborating a little bit more on sort of Europe, um, with the negative headlines surrounding the European debt crisis, do you think that the long-standing travel patterns we have as Americans of traveling to Europe will be affected this year? Not, not one iota, personally. Right, right, uh, I, I don't right. think that has any bearing on travel to Europe this year. Um, it, it, it's just the Eurozone crisis is there. If anything, it could help because the value of the Europe might go down, although I'm surprised it hasn't gone down more. Um, it, you know, for how many years now we've been seeing a high euro, and everybody says, oh, it's so expensive in Europe. And, uh, but we need a strong dollar. We do need a strong dollar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, which, you know, I think that if there's some spillover and it affects the world, yes, uh, it could be a problem. But in terms of the destinations, and I was just in Greece, I was in Italy, I was places where they were having protests, you know, seem to change every leaders on the fly every two seconds. It really, uh, and now that's to say, I think your question further was, will this cause travelers to go to other places? I think they're going to go to other places anyway, too, not just Europe, not because of that, but because they may have been to Europe. I think they'll go to other, they'll try out other destinations because now they're experienced in certain areas and they'll move on to, to other things. That's, that's why I see. Parts of Asia, specifically China, continue to experience dramatic growth in visitor arrivals. Why do you think Asia is starting to emerge in sort of um, the, the popular conscience of Americans at this point in time? And maybe, Terry, do you want to? Why not? I, I mean, when you think about the presence uh, of China in particular in absolutely everything we do, it seems like, and I think they're today the largest investor in our, in our government. So it's just, and I, I also think that the 2008 Olympics, um, they did such an extraordinary job in the execution, the architecture that was built, uh, that that glow continues. But it's just, uh, it's, I think, human nature that you want to get there, explore it. So I, I think you'll continue to see uh, the interest uh, in Asia and China in particular really, really grow. I, I also feel that it's the reason why it's becoming so popular and that you are, you're, you're seeing more like of a massive, you know, uh, 
type of visitors there. You know, it's it's because those, many of those countries, like China specifically, um, they are making themselves more available, and their infrastructure has grown <coughs> to fit more of a, a broader portfolio, especially within the luxury, within the luxury travel. I mean, Hong Kong, for instance, they have done an amazing job. The the they are hip, they are happening, they are interesting, they are exciting. They have all of these things that they've always been, and they continue to be. So China is just opening their doors, basically. And also the, the hotel infrastructure in China, if anybody reads Travel Pulse, it seems every day I see a new luxury hotel yeah. being opened in China, right. and in cities that you didn't even hear of yeah, before. Yeah. 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 You know, it, it's not just the big Shanghai, Beijing, you know, it's Shenzhen, and it's it's Chengdu, it's wherever, and everybody's got their five-star, well, I mean, a good one, uh, Tibet. Uh, there's a new luxury hotel in uh, Lhasa. I mean, it's crazy uh, how much, and now granted, uh, some of that's going to be for the Chinese market. And, you know, we're all waiting for that, too, to come here. Absolutely. So um, we talked about the luxury market a little bit now, and, and 10 years ago, spa was big in the luxury market. Everybody was getting into the spa business. What, what's today's luxury market buzzword. What, what's the, besides sort of experiences and rich experiences, are you seeing as sort of the luxury buzzword? Well, I luxury guy. You know, the, the whole idea of luxury, we are virtuoso, first of all. We are trying to uh, move away from the concept of being, you know, the specialist in luxury travel because of the reasons that we want to be. Luxury in the form that we've known it traditionally has become massified, right? So if you can have a certain threat count in your beds and the and you can have a certain, you know, marble bath, you can call yourself luxury. When in fact that, you know, you can't argue with that. But in reality, it's it's really I go back to, to the whole idea of of it, of of it being experiential. You know, it's it's what you can do with with the experience. And the experience, if you I think every one of us who are in luxury, the experience at the end of the day is brought, just the infrastructure needs to be in a certain place, but what creates the special touch and what creates the experience is the human contact that you have at any given of those destinations. And it can be from the, the type of, the quality of the people that, that were at the spa that you that made it so special, right? Or it could be the level of, of how interesting the person was when you were in a particular destination and you got to meet a, a musician or an artist or, or a revolutionary or w whatever that person might be, you know. But I think that luxury, what defines luxury, is not the, the infrastructure that we used to define it. It's just really there as the basis for, for the component there that is, that is human, it's the human experience, you know. One of the sectors that we've seen really boom over the last few years is the cruise sector among the American population, both large ship and river cruising. Um, throwing this out to the panel, why do you think that's happening, and will it continue? Uh, I, I think, well, Terry, who used to be clear, you can't talk about cruises anymore, right? That's awesome. <laughs> um, uh, it's the all-inclusive nature of cruising, I think, and, and as you go up into, up into the higher-end parts of cruising, it's even more all-inclusive, and in riverboat cruising, it's all-inclusive. If you stay in one place, you move around, uh, it's, you don't have to worry about things. And I think I will say that that's happening with tours to some extent as well. But cruising is, is the you know, explosion of product over the past few years. I mean, I, when I came to the business 20 some years ago, we didn't have the ships and the product that we have today. Whether it's a big ship or a small ship or a river, we didn't have river cruising very much. River cruising was for old German people. You know, I mean, it, it really was, and now we've, we've Americanized it and, and internationalized it, and then upscale cruising has just gone off, way off the charts in terms of what you get for your money. Um, and even, even in mass market cruising, I mean, you know, I mean, the food used to be horrible in mass market, or I should say contemporary, right? That was it. <laughs> it was a euphemism for mass market, and now it's, it's pretty darn good, um, and people enjoy that. Um, I do think, and there's a question I think you later, that it's a way to get people uh, affiliated with destinations that they can then go back and explore. And that's probably another thing to, to why cruising is popular. So you should work for Clea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't ask me. You know, <laughs> to, to add to that, it's also a great way to personally sidestep multi-destinations. Yeah. 
with the call the conference desk, right. you know, that James was just saying. You get to say, see, you know, and if any of those destinations that you visited interest your country, you can always go back and explore it, you know, in a more in-depth way. So then it's a very comfortable way to do it. And the way you do it in depth then is on a tour. Exactly. Right. <laughs> right. There you go. So, <laughs> so, yeah. You know, look, um, cruising is fantastic. It, it, it's a great, comfortable, easy, convenient experience. And, and there's room for obviously a healthy cruise industry and a healthy tour industry. And, uh, you know, it's more about growing the uh, pool of travelers as opposed to trying to shift market share from this to that. It's, you know, we're all part of the big happy family and uh, cruising is going to be successful and the tour operator industry is going to be successful and uh, with everybody's help in here. Speaking of the big happy family, baby boomers continue to be the most lucrative travel segment for most destination marketing <coughs> organizations. Uh, yet starting this year, 8,000 boomers will turn 65 each day for the next 18 years. What recommendations do you have for travel destinations who wish to court this sizable market as it ages? Well, I'd start with a couple. First of all, uh, don't assume that they are, just because they're aging, uh, that they are going to be passive, because it's actually quite the opposite. Uh, they are much more active, and they want to be active. You know, they, they're open to soft adventure. You know, they, they want to go out and, you know, climb on rocks and kayak. And so don't uh, pigeonhole them into a, you know, single, you know, they just want to take an afternoon nap. Um, they want activity. I, I want to do that, Terry. I know. Uh, <laughs> that's why you're a boomer. Uh, actually, no, I'm, I'm a Generation Joneser, as I found out the other day, which is a new category, which is the ones who have the kids in college and the aging parents. Oh, okay. So that's a new one. I'm a, wow. It's a division of baby boomers. Exactly. Subdivision. Subdivision. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. And I guess the second thing is, you know, they're leading another trend which we hear about all the time, and that's the multi-generational travel. Yeah. You know, the, the baby boomers are the ones spearing that. So, you know, they're, they are leading, whether it's, it's adventure, multi-generational travel, or just pure boomer travel. But it's, it's uh, more at that. Very good. All right. Um, are there other market segments that we should be prepared for um, in terms of making significant infrastructure changes? Maybe it's Gen Y. Maybe it's I, I think any any of the generations. You know, we we focused on the baby boomers for a long time, and that believe me, that market is just coming into its own right now. And so, don't forget about that. Uh, the, I know I've gone to a lot of travel conferences. We're already on to the next one. And I'm saying, well, wait a minute, there's ton, ton, plenty of business with the baby boomers. You know, I am one. I'm at the younger end of it, luckily. But, uh, you know, it, it's, but then, yes, the next generations. Now, this, this, the next few generations, as you know, are very well connected. They're very well traveled, far, far more traveled than any other generations. And, you know, their parents have taken them everywhere. Um, you know, they've had lots of experiences. And now, of course, they, they're engaged totally with social networking and, Facebook and Twitter, and they know a lot of stuff. They have friends all over the world. So you can't just, you know, you, you have to, you've got to go in thinking they know a lot. And so when you market to them, you can't just, they're not, you're not going to put anything over on them. Uh, they, they know, they're going to know a lot more about that destination before they go there. And they have a lot of desire to go to places. So I, I think this is one of the most well-traveled and eager to travel generations in history. So I, I would just like to add to that, that you know, we, we've done some, some research our own, on our own and studies, and, and what it shows is it's, it's a very socially conscious group of travelers, you know, even more so than their parents. Because the, the baby boomers... We've just had a fire drill. We're sorry about that, but we it is only a test, and so we are going to continue and try to close the door. There's no real fire. No real fire, fire. No real fire. No, it's an actual fire, but we're going to anyway. It's, 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 it's only a test. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, crisis management is the next topic. Yeah. Um, in terms of you were talking about this next generation being very. Um, savvy, both about destinations, but they are also socially, aware, they? socially yes. aware. They're also very well connected digitally. And we um, constantly hear about, particularly from um, from consumers, that there were, you know, they refer a lot to TripAdvisor and that TripAdvisor plays a major role in con the consumer marketing sphere. 
Um, James, I want to address this to you, but what role is there for the traditional travel advisor these days, um, given that you have things like TripAdvisor out there? Well, all right. I'm, I'm sort of contrary. And TripAdvisor, and I met the guys when they first started this, and it's a great tool. It's one tool to get some idea of what uh, a hotel is specifically. But unfortunately, I think it, there's been far too much focus on it. They've done a damn good job about publicizing what they do. Uh, but it's definitely one. And I know hotels who hate TripAdvisor. Uh, TripAdvisor actually just got sued by a hotel, but that's another story because of the reviews that were on there were inaccurate, done by people who were actually aimed at getting that hotel down. So, and you mentioned what's versus TripAdvisor. First of all, they can't be a personal advisor to you like a trip. And you said traditional travel consultant. Uh, what is a traditional travel agent today? There aren't any. You know, there's some on the corner. I mean, do you know any on the corner? There are very few of them. A, a, a travel counselor today is someone that is a mobile. Most of the ones who sell leisure, to be honest with you, the, the majority of them are working either at home or on the road. And they're all over the place, whether it's folks from virtuoso agency who are off on a cruise and still booking their clients. I was sitting in Nice Airport last week with 100 virtuoso, and they, they, they were all on their, their Blackberries and iPhones working with their clients. Now, they're not in an office, so the traditional typical travel agent you saw down, the one in the village down that you went to go to get your trip, no, that may be gone. But they are all over, all among you, as they say. Uh, you just have to find a good one. And once you get a good one, like a good lawyer or a good doctor, you, you stick with that person and, you, and they'll help you discover the world. Service, service, availability, the consultant who is well connected, who can get the room when nobody else can get it, you can have somebody who is not a VIP, VIP them wherever they go, and, and have the connections to make sure that the client, have, being very well connected around the world, and also being available to the client as much of the time as possible. That, I think, is defining, you know, the travel consultant. Uh, it's someone that can go beyond themselves to provide the right experience for a variety of clients. And what I mean by that is, like, if you have a particular interest that is very specific, I don't have to be the person, you know, an expert on that particular interest, but I can have the connections of getting in touch. I have the right connections, the you know, the, the resources to get in touch with the expert that will provide the most fulfilling and most enriching uh, uh, vacation for you. We're going to ask you folks to do a little sort of projection or forecasting in your mind. But in November, Forbes Travel Guide debuted Startle, a new online travel planning site for luxury travel, which launched in 72 U.S. markets and five international markets. It faces competition from a number of other travel planning sites like Jet Setter and Oyster. Will these websites, uh, what will these websites do to the likes of traditional uh, traditional travel agents, <laughs> non-website um, organizations, or tour operators. Do you think they'll? I, I, I think that all of those are different plays to different markets. They're not really travel trip planning sites. Jet Setter is is basically a distress sale for a luxury goods site. Um, uh, Oyster is actually a trip advisor kind of play. Um, uh, the new one, I, I you know, Startle, I just heard about recently. I, you know, it, it sounds interesting, but is it going to replace, you know, travel agents or tour operators? I, I just don't believe so. I mean, you'll have certain people who will go. It's another source of information. And to be honest with you, the web the travel is like the number one or two, you know, uh, website. There are more travel sites on the web than almost anything else. And people, I think, are getting confused. I mean, there's so much out there, and, and it, it's hard to discern. So all of a sudden, you find yourself giving someone a guide to get to the website. So it's also, you, you know, this report never mentioned the amount of bookings that are getting done through yeah. the site. And that's ultimately that it's a segment that has not grown. You know, the sites keep getting better and they keep getting more interesting, but the actual bookings have not grown. Because I think it has to do with the fact that people are looking for the expertise that no site can provide you. That it has to do with human beings being connected with other human beings from the source of whatever that experience is. I happen to be more bullish today about the, you keep referring to the traditional travel counselor consultant than I have been ever. And, and the, I, I think part of it stems to the fact that 
Uh, we've all heard, seen, touched, Occupy, Wall Street. Well, the one area where I would venture to guess that we all have poverty <laughs> is time poverty. And so when you mention all of these different, whether it's distribution, online, and so on and so forth, and, and you're looking at complex, complex travel purchasing, you know, who has the time to really do the research and help you make the right decision? And, and you know, when you've got such limited time, you've got to have that relationship with a professional travel counselor consultant uh, so that you're using the, your time wisely and your money wisely. So I, these uh, mechanisms will continue to grow, uh, and there'll be more and more of them. But I just I think that it's, uh, it, it only means that the, the travel seller is going to be uh, even more valued in the future. Um, one of the things that we see is this sort of growth for agents and tour operators to communicate digitally with their consumers using social media, Facebook, Twitter, um, blogs. Yet we haven't seen a big uptake in the number of tour operators and travel agents that are communicating with industry partners on those platforms. Why do you think that is? Because I don't have it in place yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, we're doing, I mean, we're a B2B, so we are using those mechanisms to communicate what we do to, to our audience and to the industry professionals that we, we are, who are our subscribers. I mean, we use uh, Facebook and Twitter to tweet out our stories, our videos. Uh, we try to create more social communities of, of our readers, and that's pretty much it. But I, I'm not sure exactly how suppliers are going to use that. They've been using it to connect to con consumers, as have travel agents, somewhat very successfully. Uh, there are some great travel agents who are using uh, uh, Twitter and Facebook amazingly, not just to blast you, with, blast you with deals, but to really go out and be Pied Pipers. You know, there's a, a, a young a woman who's a travel agent who really specializes in that, and she goes all over the world, and you want to be like, you want to travel like her. You want to talk about Stacy, but uh, oh, yeah. um, uh, Stacy Small, who goes out and here she is in Monte Carlo. Where, it's like, where's Waldo? Where's Stacy? And 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 and, they, and she gets, you know, she's hooked into uh, a lot of very high-end clients because of that. Go ahead, oh, Jerry. We we talked earlier this week uh, with Muhammad in Egypt, and I think that there is huge potential for us here that we haven't tapped because in situations like uh, Egypt where the situation is fluid, and yet we know that what you see on TV isn't necessarily reflective of the uh, experience that you can have there. So if we can take, because we had, uh, as part of a panel discussion, uh, a woman who had just returned eight days ago, and, and Mark Murphy had shot footage yeah. just a couple weeks ago of consumers over there sharing their stories. But somehow we need to take that from our DMOs uh, and get consumer you know, on the street um, this is what I'm seeing, I feel safe, and be able to funnel that to our tour operators and travel agents so when they're talking to a consumer about the possibility of looking at Cairo, uh, that they can actually funnel, here's, here's uh, some consumer responses and reactions yeah. within the last 48 hours of people who've been there and have said, I felt so incredibly safe. And the access that you have today, because it's a little softer, uh, the travel industry, is extraordinary. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So I think that there are ways that we need to be you know, tying in together through social media that can help us reassure consumers and help sell. Yeah, we're already doing that. In fact, the, the videos you saw of uh, Mark Murphy in Egypt, which were taken two weeks before, uh, were an attempt and then funneling out to tour operators, to travel agents, who then can send that to their, to their customers. And you know we have a YouTube channel that's offline with has you know videos of Mark everywhere, you know, uh, and and this is this is what we've been trying to do to get people communicate to people that it's not just looking at CNN, which is an awful source to get a sense of what's going on in a country. To be honest with you, and I've been to many countries where the CNN coverage was just hideous, and I get calls saying, "Are you all right? Are you all right?" I said, "There's nothing going on here." You know, when when you look at Egypt is a classic example, and. You just don't get a good sense of the rest of the country and what it, that it is safe, that people are not, you know, riding in the streets. Um, and and there, it, it's hard. It's, it's been a problem for the travel industry for day one. You know, it's the CNN effect. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, CNN has so, so much power that they can really ruin a destination very quickly. I'd like to just say one more thing. 
for my friends from Japan and Muhammad is here and Yuki and uh, and, that, and that is you know our survey found we asked um, those countries and destinations that are dealing with uh, crisis situations and recovering um, do you intend to increase itineraries to those uh, destinations and and over 50 percent said that they intended to do so next year and I think that that's critical that we we as a travel family we do have a commitment to one another and we do want to help uh, them rebuild and I think that that's that's important connecting with what we call quote the right agents is integral to many destination marketing organizations growth strategies from your experience what marketing mechanisms do your readers or members say are the most effective in capturing their attention in a very cluttered marketplace is it advertising is it editorial? Is it direct marketing that they receive? Is it specialist programs? Is it webinars? It, it, what do they tell you? It's a combination of all of them. I mean, the people want information they want the way they want it. And, you know, we, that's why we, in our group, we have a, all of that is available. We certainly love print support for advertising, for branding. And I think that's a, been a loss in, in this digital world is that people forget the value of print. Uh, in a magazine with branding is still very important. Uh, you know, I know Bert Russo has a print magazine, and uh, and and yet, as a, for, to connect with travel agents, we have travel agent educational courses we offer. We obviously have the Travel Pulse, where we're getting out every day. We have videos. I mean, you have to be in all these spaces. Uh, it, it depends on the kind of campaign you want as a destination, and then you decide. You know, pick from a. And I'm not just talking about my own publications. I mean, a lot of my competitors have similar things. We think we do better, but that's okay. Um, and there's definitely ways to communicate. You just have to decide the right strategy and we're also there to help you. But I think that our experience when I, when I see a virtuoso is that whatever the medium might be for whatever the client, we have a, a very segmented uh, database. You know, we've been working on that database for over 25 years now. So a lot of those clients, our agencies really do know them very well and they have told us specifically how they'd like us to communicate with them. So whoever is receiving an email is because they told us so. Whoever is receiving Virtuoso Life is because they told us so and they absolutely love it. They know that it's a very privileged magazine. But above the actual print, you know, this is where we always try to, we're constantly trying to outsmart ourselves. When in fact, what we need to do is just to open our eyes and just and to see what's there. There is there's a sense and it's listening to what the clients are telling us. Clients of Virtuoso are telling me, they have told me over and over, that the reason what they love the magazine, it's beautiful, and it's one of the most beautiful travel magazines. But what they love about it is that it really speaks to them, and it's, it's created by a world that they trust, because they belong. They are Virtuoso clients, and these are Virtuoso suppliers, and the person that sends it that magazine is a Virtuoso travel consultant. So it is a, it is a messaging Yes, it comes in print, but it's a message of where it's coming from. So that's the thing, you know, there is no particular, you know, especially for a lot of the companies in travel, the more unique the experience it gets, they don't have the budget to simply, you know, you see, we see it with tour operators, primarily they don't simply have the budget to get their message across in a big way, marketing-wise. So they need to be very, very specific as to what the audience is and what the medium is for their, for their particular audience. So I really think that that's a key element that you know people need to trust. If you're looking at your marketing venues, there needs to be brands that you know that the clients that you're trying to reach trust. That's that's really it. It boils down to that. I agree. <laughs> Very good. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about um, sales uh, from a tour operator perspective because. One thing that some folks in this room are tapped with is actually getting more tour operators to sell their destination. And oftentimes, what we'll hear from tour operators is, there's just no demand for your destination, so we're not going to sell it. What's the best way, Terry, in your opinion, to lobby a tour operator if you really believe that if they just offered the destination, there would be demand? I, I'm a firm believer in, in the relationship and, and building that relationship with the tour operator, educating the tour operator on the opportunities. Look, we're all in this to make money. So how can the tour operator make money off of your destination? How can you create the experiences that you've heard about today in your destination? And, and if you have that, you know, and, and you've used the word many times, trust, 
over time you'll build that trust and that relationship with them that you will get them to start uh, building product. But you, you've got to demonstrate to them that you've got it and that you can make it easier for them to create the itineraries. And also um, working with the travel agents then too. Because if the tour operator is hearing travel agents saying, yes, I, I'm hearing more and more about Flanders, for example. And, and I'm seeing more and more from Julie from Flanders. And so it's just like their client. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's, 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 more, it's not a single, you know, one thing, but it's just building the relationships with the agents, the tour operators, and the programs, and, and, and it'll happen. Never as fast as we want it to, but it's, I'm a firm believer it's, it's uh, in those relationships that you build. What advice would you give to destinations who want to build that trust? Where should they be? What should they be doing? Well, USDOA. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think the beauty of USTOA is that it's a small, intimate group that, you know, when you only have 650, 700 people together for three and a half days, that's why I'm a little hoarse, I'm a little <laughs> not at my best right now. We're talking it off, sir. I don't know I why. Know. Why. The whole time. But it, it's just really, you know, that's the form to build the relationship. And, and, you know, Virtual Science has an extraordinary event in Las Vegas every right. year. And so, it's, you know, take advantage of those opportunities. Um, well, that's where it happens. Well, one of the things, in fact, that is, you've probably heard this from us, like the value proposition of Virtual for a destination specifically, it's threefold. You have access to a very strong, well-traveled database of consumers, and then you have probably the greatest sales force there is in the world today as a group, I'm not saying that the only good salespeople in the, in the world, but as a, as a whole, it's probably the greatest and strongest. Uh, but at the same time, you also have the ability to develop product. And you can do, when developing product is by establishing those connections with people who are within the virtual network and utilizing the venues that we provide, the meetings, the regionals, the webinars, etc., to develop those relationships that, again, they have to do with developing the trust. And, you know, James, do you have any additional thoughts that may be different from what's shared by I think we're different, except that we offer you, uh, also reach a, a broader audience. So we go to virtuoso agents, we go to agents across the board. We go to basically 80,000 travel agents with our various media. So we develop, you know, we're hopefully at this point, even though we're a relatively new publication, only about seven years old, uh, have developed trust with our readership. And that, you know, I do know that, and I did work at, at other publications in the past, um, and I never get the reception. I mean, we got tremendous reception for our publications, a real affinity that I've never seen before, especially, you know, Agent at Home, uh, that, we, you know, that segment of the market didn't exist 10 years ago. Uh, vacation Agent, Leisure Selling, uh, Travel Pulse, I'm always surprised at the number of people that read it. Um, you know, we do have a number of vehicles, and you can come in and talk to us, and we can help you design a program that might that work across all, all segments of the market. Videos, uh, we just mentioned Mark Murphy goes over to Egypt to really showcase your destination. There's a lot of different vehicles. I do think video is the way to go. We're the only ones now in the trade space that are doing videos, um, you know, and, and doing it every day. And we have big plans in that area, and you'll see it soon uh, in the next few months so that, that our site's going to expand and have a lot more video on it. So. I think, from my perspective, uh, certainly come work with us. <laughs> Very good. Well, one final question. In our professional lives, each of us from DMOs are trying to improve every day. So if you would have to call out one pet peeve from a media perspective, from a tour operator perspective, and from an agent perspective that you see DMOs do that we simply just shouldn't do, what would that be? That's a tough one. No names, just what's the activity? <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's an activity, and I, I've said it to some people in the room. I said, when you have someone out in the market as a spokesperson for the U.S. market, it really has to be someone who speaks colloquial English and be out there in the market. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's a real challenge for Americans. We don't speak a lot of languages, unfortunately. And to have someone who's accessible and really seems to be someone who gets the U.S. market as opposed to, you know, and there's some great destinations out there that just don't connect well uh, for language issue or something like that. And, you know, they try very hard, and, and it, they just don't get their message across um, as well. 
Um, I do find the, the destinations that, that I think really do a great job, at least with the trade and with consumers, are ones that have a, a great spokesperson out there in the market. And I think that ties in uh, with what my pet peeve would be. That great spokesperson is also somebody who does their homework and their research. So if you've asked for an appointment to meet with ANK or TAL, then you sure as heck should know who they are, what their background is, do they come to their, your country or close to your country? No, so that you don't waste their time or your time. So I, I'd say somebody who doesn't do their homework is probably a pet peeve. Um, we have the luxury, and there are many of our preferred destinations here in this room now, they're all very in tune, they're all very sales and training driven type of organizations. You know, so we, we have all that working very well. What I would say is don't, don't ever, if an agency is reaching out to you for expertise, just don't send them back to the basics. You know, like don't send them a brochure or, yeah. or a link or something. It's like they're looking at the inside folk, the inside information. Just don't tell them to look at the website. That's, that's, I hear that a lot. Oh, it's, everything's on the website. It doesn't really happen. I mean, we have really great relationships with our partners, and it's really you know, relationships that have been built throughout the years and they know each other because they need a travel mark. And so there is a report already. But don't do that. It's just made it now. Then you lose face completely. At this point in time, we'd like to open up the floor for questions. And does anyone in the room have a question? And we'll try to repeat it so our, uh, so our webinar guests can hear as well. Um, Pete Johnson from the Surgeon Authority of allow a lot of the agents to experience firsthand what it is that we have to offer. Um, I don't know why this is, but when you have a group of travel agents that you're inviting to come to your destination, all expenses paid, and they're complaining about the fact that they're sitting in economy, um, or they're complaining about the fact that they want to know who's going, um, so that they can, it makes it extremely difficult to work with community, particularly the community um, that deals with the higher end of the market. Um, so my question to you is, why has it become difficult or challenging, I should say, to work with the Asian community um, in building awareness? Uh, For you? Oh, well, we'll start with that one. The question is, why has it become increasingly difficult to deal with the travel agent community and build those relationships? Well. I think, you know, we may be frank, I think you are referring to virtuoso agents that you put them on coach, right? Like, I, I, they do not like that, I can tell you that. And so, we, we can speak, you know, openly. And I think that what we have found in terms of educational trips, first of all, there is a tremendous amount of interest within the virtuoso network in going to uh, any given destination. And they have to go through a whole process of applying and they need to justify what they, why they are going, you know, whether it's free or, or not. And what, you, what we have found is that these people are, are, the last thing they're looking for is for a, just a trip. If they're going to a particular destination, it's because they have a genuine interest in learning about the destination or whether it's because they're selling it or their clients are selling it. It really is very, very, uh, it's, it's something that's very consistent that we find over and over. You know, I. I'm involved with a lot of the educational trips that we do with our with our tourism boards, uh, and our tourism boards are very proactive with with their educational trips. So that's that's the quality. What in terms of what may be happening to you, for instance, like what we find is that if you ask a virtuoso agency, for instance, I'm going to speak only for virtuoso because I really don't know the others. A virtuoso agency, if if it's not 
a virtuoso sponsor or a virtuoso under the umbrella. First of all, Thailand is not a virtuoso preferred destination. I mean, it has all the qualities to be one, but we don't, you just don't have that status for whatever reason. But they would definitely go on a virtuoso trip because what that is telling them is that a virtuoso trip is going to be in tune with what they are looking to learn so that they can come back and in turn sell to their clients, which is all high end. And like for instance, we know that 80% or 90% of the clients, the virtuoso clients that go to Thailand would go on business class. So if a virtuoso agent is going to Thailand, they would not want to experience coach. They would want to know what business class is on any given airline. But, sir, doesn't that make it it does, but that's why if, when, you're, when you are part of Virtuoso, what we do, we together work with our airline partners so it doesn't become <laughs> your problem. It becomes, it becomes a collective issue that we all get to work together with. So it's in, 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 if you're having this issue with Virtuoso, it is probably because you are not in Virtuoso, to be honest with you. You know, like I don't think it's experience. Linda just had a trip to Hong Kong, which was a total success. She had amazing players and, and a great, great trip. And, you know, we had a trip to Ireland last year. And, you know, I mean, now the partners of Virtuoso here can tell you that their experience is not that it's getting, you know, the trips get filled up. We get uh, applications, you know, in some cases, even to go on a trip, we'll ask them to take this specialist uh, course that any given country may have. You need to become a specialist on that country before you even get on this trip. And you know, and people do do it and then they come back and they do their homework and we have a system now I was just accompanying a trip to Spain for a few days. Uh, you know, each participant, they were given a particular day that they needed to be in charge of and present in depth when they come back. So they not only go and experience this, you have eight or 10 or 12 people experiencing this trip, but then they come back and they do a webinar where they have another 80 or 100 or 150 virtuoso agents who are hearing firsthand from the experience that their own peers just had in that particular country. So with us, it's the opposite. If anything, with us, it, it's growing the interest in, work, in working with destinations. So I'll be interested in talking to you afterwards because it, it really, for us, is a different experience. And you had a second question? Yeah, I did have a question for, for Mr. Dale. Um, I find that in dealing with toll operators, um, it's not so much a question of how can we grow uh, programs, how can we uh, together grow business, uh, what's working and what's not working. Um, a lot of the questions that we get is how much money can you give us next year? Give us or invest with us through co-op marketing? Is that what you're? Yes. Okay. Uh, it, for example, you said come prepared, do your homework. Um, and I agree with you 100%. Um, but at the same time, if you're asking me to um, either provide you with the same level of funding that I gave you this year, next year, or higher, then you need to do your homework for me so that you can tell me, well, why is it that I'm giving you, why is it that you're asking me for an additional um, co-op marketing budget. What have you produced with that money that I've given you? Mm -hmm. And nine times out of ten, um, it's not there. It's pulling teeth. To get I mean, it's pulling teeth to get information from the from the co-op Good for me to hear. I mean, for example, on a on a monthly basis or on a quarterly basis, my director will ask me for updates from my co operator partners on what bookings have been, what are advanced bookings. We recently had a crisis in Thailand. We wanted to know. Are your bookings dropping? Are you right, getting cancellations, right. etc.? Now, even from those partners that we're giving co-op funds, that that information is not readily available. It's not readily forthcoming. We've had to operate to tell us, well, that's proprietary information. We're not asking you for names and specifics, etc. All we're asking you for is the number. What is it? This year mm -hmm. compared to November last year, December last year. Can you address that at all, Terry? Well, I, uh, it's good for me to hear this. Uh, I, I was unaware of the situation. I believe that the uh, come prepared works both ways. So my members need to be prepared when speaking with you as well. So, um, and, and I don't have an answer, to be quite truthful. Um, I would hope that we, as an industry,
industry could give you some directional guidance, like you said, as opposed to a specific name. But um, we should be able to give you some kind of directional guidance. But we've got um, an associate advisory committee that we uh, put in place for the first time this year. So you know, those are the types of issues that uh, should be put on the table and we discuss as an industry. So I appreciate you raising it. Other questions from the floor or those on the webinar? Yes. Yeah, I'd like to add an have expectations of that ROI and, and you know I was in your shoes for the first I don't know 10 I don't want to date myself that much a long time the beginning of my career and so I certainly understand from your perspective that you have um, municipalities and, and governments that expect you to be able to demonstrate what you're delivering on behalf of those cost of dollars so but I think yeah probably having very clearly defined um, expectations sort of low-cost ones that don't give a lot of information. Um, you know, we all will, will, we will work with you on a variety of different levels. Um, you know, I think training programs now are getting a lot more interactive with video and stuff, and it's what we try to do. I was actually, you know, there at the dawn of these programs back in the 90s. Um, they were all print supplements, as we know, and today they're really online. Uh, I think agents do like them. It's one of the biggest areas when we ask what they want more of is destination training. So I do think they are. But you do also have to use what you get out of them. Uh, it's your database once you get it. And it, it, I mean, sometimes we can work with you to help you, uh, you know, massage that database better and work with the, your agents. But I see an awful lot of times where a destination will go in, buy a specialist program or develop it on their own. They get a lot of agents to, to do it, and then they do nothing with it. Um, and I've worked, we, we do have programs with a lot of the folks in this room. Um, and the, the idea is it really is those are your people at that point. They're yours. And it's really up to you to decide what you do, whether it's take them on a FAM. Um, and it, it really is something, you know, a lot of people just do it and they don't, they don't use what they have. They don't use the resources they've developed. Yeah, well, so, There are a lot of different choices. So, there are a lot of choices. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think it's worth it whether you do it on your own or whether you do it with some, with a partner. Uh, whether you do it with with you can do it with the various travel agency organizations. You can do it with us and our our competitors. Um, it, it, there's a lot of choice. I mean, to be honest with you, 20 years ago these programs didn't exist, um, and and it really you have to find the right fit for you and what works. But again, no matter what it is, even even if it's your own, once you get that database. You know your agents; they're your people. 
don't just let them fade away, and, and you have to constantly be in communication with them. We have one yeah. more comment from Mauricio. I just want to do to add to, to what Jen said that, you know, it, it's they're really your sales force. And, you know, we all know that our advisors are very aware of the fact that they need to be a specialist. So what is interesting, if you get someone to be a specialist in Ireland, is because that person has a particular passion or interest in Ireland. It's not just because I want to be a specialist in Ireland. That just doesn't happen. So there are already people who are on your court, they are in tune, that you can mold, direct them, guide them, help them, and they can really be a key player to generate sales. And that's what James is saying. That part is lacking, and that's something that even us as virtuoso need to create. We are working on creating a better environment, in which is just not only have the specialist program, we recruit the people to take it, but what do you do with them? Like the next thing that we're going to go and ask all of you, our partners who are in the room, is that what do we do? And I think I mentioned it to you at our last meeting. Can we start a, a lead generation program with, with the specialists? You know, can we generate business? Can you provide leads so that they can begin to sell? And we are we actually do have partners where we do get them to generate leads to the agents who do take their particular destination. Uh, we do have a, a couple of those. Now, not all of them, but some, one, there's a couple in particular that w there is now on their website. Uh, it, the leads are going to the agents who passed the specialist program. Well, that concludes our session for today. We encourage all of you who are here in New York to extend your time, talk to our speakers over some food and some wine and in our office. But uh, please join me in welcome or in thanking our three panelists. Hi, you're welcome. Thank you.